Chapter 37, Circulatory and Respiratory Systems. Chapter 37-1, The Circulatory System. Your heartbeat is a sign of life itself. Even when you drift off to sleep, your heart continues to beat at a steady rhythm. Why is this process so important that it must keep going even when you're asleep? Each breath you take brings air into your respiratory system. The oxygen in that air is needed by the trillions of cells in your body. Your heart is essential in delivering that oxygen. Its beating produces the force to move oxygen-rich blood through the circulatory system. Interrelationships between the circulatory and respiratory systems supply cells throughout the body with the nutrients and oxygen they need to survive. Functions of the circulatory system Organisms composed of a small number of cells do not need a circulatory system. Most cells in such organisms are in direct contact with the environment. Oxygen, nutrients, and waste products can easily diffuse back and forth across cell membranes. Larger organisms, however, cannot rely on diffusion. Most of their cells are not in direct contact with the environment, and substances made in one part of the organism may be needed in another part. In a way, this problem is faced by millions of people living in a large city. Cities have transportation systems that move people, goods, and waste material from one place to another. The transportation system of a city is its streets, highways, and rail lines. The transportation system of a living organism is its circulatory system. Humans and other vertebrates have closed circulatory systems. This means that a circulating fluid called blood is contained within a system of vessels. In the human circulatory system consists of the heart, a series of blood vessels, and the blood that flows through them. The heart. As you can feel with your hand, your heart is located near the center of your chest. The heart, which is composed almost entirely of muscle, is a hollow organ that is about the size of your clenched fist. The heart is enclosed in a protective sac of tissue called the pericardium. In the walls of the heart, there are two thin layers of epilethial and connective tissue that form a sandwich around a thick layer of muscle called the myocardium. The powerful contractions of the myocardium pump blood through the circulatory system. The heart muscle contracts on average 72 times a minute, pumping about 70 milliliters of blood within each contraction. This means that during one year, an average person's heart beats more than enough blood to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. An Olympic-sized swimming pool is about 200 million liters. Dividing the right side of the heart from the left side of the heart is the septum. The septum pre prevents the mixing of oxygen-poor and oxygen-rich blood. On each side of the septum are two chambers. The upper chamber, which receives the blood, is the atrium. The lower chamber, which pumps blood out of the heart, is the ventricle. The heart has four chambers in total, two atria and two ventricles. Circulation through the body. The heart functions as two separate pumps. The right side of the heart pumps blood from the heart to the lungs. This pathway is known as the pulmonary circulation. In the lungs, carbon dioxide leaves the blood and oxygen is, is absorbed. The oxygen-rich blood then flows into the left side of the heart and is pumped to the rest of the body. This pathway is called systemic circulation. Blood that returns to the right side of the heart is oxygen-poor because cells have absorbed much of the oxygen and loaded the blood with carbon dioxide. At this point, it is ready for another trip to the lungs. Circulation through the heart. Blood enters the heart through the right and left atria. As the heart contracts, Blood flows into the ventricles and then out of the vent out from the ventricles to the either the body or the lungs. There are flaps with connected tissue called valves between the atria and the ventricles. Blood moving from the atria holds the valves open. When the ventricles contract, the valves close, which prevent blood from flowing back into the atria. At the exits from the right and left ventricles, there are valves that prevent blood that flows out of the heart from flowing back in. This system of valves keeps blood moving through the heart in one direction, like traffic on a one-way street. The one-way flow increases the pumping efficiency of the heart. The valves are so important to the heart function that surgeons often attempt to, rep re to repair or replace a valve that has been damaged due to disease. Heartbeat. There are two networks of muscle fibers in the heart, one in the atria and one in the ventricles. When a single fiber in either network is stimulated, all the fibers are stimulated and the network contracts as a unit. Each contraction begins in a small group of cardiac muscle cells, the synotrial node located in the right atrium. Because these cells set the pace for the heart as a whole by starting the wave of muscle contraction through the heart, they are also called the pacemaker. The impulse spreads from the pacemaker, SA node, to the network of fibers in the atria. 
It is picked up by a bundle of fibers called the atrial ventricle node and, card and carried to the network of fibers in the ventricles. When the network in the atria contracts, blood in the atria flows into the ventricles. When the muscles in the ventricles contract, blood flows out of the heart. This two-step pattern of contraction makes the heart a more efficient pump. Your heart can beat faster or more slowly, depending on your body's need for oxygen-rich blood. During vigorous exercise, your heart rate may increase to about 200 beats per minute. Although the heartbeat is not directly controlled by the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system does influence heart rate. Neurotransmitters released by the sympathetic nervous system increase heart rate. Those released by the parasympathetic nervous system decrease heart rate. Blood vessels. Blood leaving the left side of the heart is loaded with oxygen from the lungs. When it leaves the left ventricle, the blood passes into a large blood vessel known as the aorta. The aorta is the first of a series of blood vessels that carry the blood on its round trip through the body and back to the heart. As blood flows through the circulatory system, it moves through three types of blood vessels, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Arteries. Large vessels that carry blood from the heart to the tissues of the body are called arteries. Arteries are the superhighways of the circulatory system. Except for the pulmonary arteries, all arteries carry oxygen-rich blood. Arteries have thick walls that help them withstand the powerful pressure produced when the heart contracts and pushes blood into the arteries. The walls of these vessels contain connective tissue, smooth muscle, and endolithium. The elastic connective tissue allows an artery to expand under pressure. Contractions of the smooth muscle regulate the diameter of an artery. Capillaries The smallest of the blood vessels are the capillaries. Capillaries are the side streets and alleys of the circulatory system. The walls of capillaries are only one cell thick, and most are so narrow that blood cells must pass through them in a single file. The real work of the circulatory system, bringing nutrients and oxygen to the tissues and absorbing carbon dioxide and other waste products from them, is done in the capillaries. Veins. Once blood has passed through the capillary system, it must be returned to the heart. This job is of the veins. As with arteries, the walls of veins contain connective tissue and smooth muscle. Large veins, such as those shown in the leg, contain valves that keep blood moving from the, toward the heart. Many veins are located near and between skeletal muscles. When you exercise, contracting these muscles helps force blood through the veins. Blood flow through the veins of the arms and legs often occur against the force of gravity. Exercise helps to keep blood from accumulating in the limbs and stretching the veins out of shape. If the walls around the veins weaken from lack of activity, the valves can weaken. This causes blood to pool in the veins, producing a condition known as firecross veins. Blood pressure. Like any pump, the heart produces pressure. When the heart contracts, it produces a wave of fluid pressure to the arteries. The force of the blood on the arteries walls is known as blood pressure. Blood pressure decreases when the heart relaxes, but the system still remains under pressure. It's a good thing too. Without that pressure, blood will stop flowing through the body. Medical workers can measure blood pressure with a device called a spingbone manometer. A cuff is wrapped around the upper arm. Air is pumped into the cuff until blood flow through an artery is blocked. As the pressure is released, the worker listens to the pulse with a stethoscope and records two numbers from a pressure gog. The first number is the systolic pressure, the force felt in the arteries when the ventricles contract. The second number is the diastolic pressure, the force of the blood felt in the arteries when the ventricles relax. A typical blood pressure reading for a healthy person is 120 over 80. The body normally regulates blood pressure in two ways. Sensory receptors at several places in the body detect the level of blood pressure, sending impulses to the medulla oblongata region of the brainstem. When blood pressure is too high, the autonomic nervous system releases neurotransmitters that cause the smooth muscles in blood vessel walls to relax, lowering blood pressure. When blood pressure is too low, neurotransmitters are released that elevate blood pressure by causing these smooth muscles to contract. The kidneys, which remove water from the blood, also help to regulate blood pressure. Hormones produced by the heart and other organs cause the kidneys to remove more water from the blood when blood pressure is high. This action reduces blood volume, thereby lowering the blood pressure.